I'm going to start by just giving sort of an introduction to FreeBSD. Uh, it's an open source operating system that was derived from 4.4 BSD Lite, uh, first released in 1992. FreeBSD is one of the very few open source projects that's still active after more than 20 years. To FreeBSD, it really provides a lot of sort of behind the scenes support. Uh, a third of all the internet traffic runs through FreeBSD. Uh, and you'll see why when I list the companies in the next uh, slide. Uh, but it does things like the root name servers, uh, a lot of the major web hosting, a lot of the routing infrastructure, and of course it's the foundation for a lot of commercial bits and pieces of operating systems. So the users of FreeBSD, essentially there's the ISP and server platforms uh, and the appliance and the embedded OS market. Uh, the, in the server platforms, we have things like Netflix, which is where a third of all the internet traffic comes from. NetGate, New York Internet, which does a lot of the network uh, infrastructure on the East Coast. And even the BBC uh, has their servers uh, primarily running on FreeBSD. Uh, the other place where you really see a lot of FreeBSD is in the appliance and the embedded OS. And this is where companies need to put their intellectual property into the operating system, and therefore the GPL doesn't work for them, as I'll talk about later. Uh, so Juniper Networks is all built on top of uh, FreeBSD Network Appliance, who is you know, file service, uh, and EMC Isilon. Uh, Isilon's another huge file server, uh, are all built in, on FreeBSD. Really, their product is embedded in FreeBSD. Uh, VeriSign, who does a whole lot of the you know, identity stuff on the, the uh, backbone of the internet. Uh, and they use FreeBSD along with Linux and along with commercial operating systems. In their case, they want a diversity of operating systems so that if there's a, uh, a root day break-in in one of them, they can take those offline and still not lose their service, which is obviously needs to be up and running all the time. Uh, and they really value FreeBSD because it is a small enough niche that there's not a lot of targeting going on to it and it's hardened enough that it's actually a lot harder to come up with a crack on FreeBSD than it is on a lot of other operating systems. Uh, in part, well, people will argue, yeah, well, because it's so slow moving, they aren't changing anything. Well, that's one of the benefits of not changing all the stuff all the time. I mean, Linux likes to talk about how they do a million lines code churn every year. And if you do a million lines of code churn, you're just going to introduce a lot of bugs that can be exploited. FreeBSD is also at the bottom of Mac OS X. Uh, the other place that you see a lot of it is in the Android phone. Not actually the operating system, but the whole user land uh, is largely FreeBSD. All right, now to understand the structure of the FreeBSD project, we actually need to wind the clock back to the 1970s and 80s when BSD was first being done at the University of California at Berkeley. We evolved from tapes and email to giving accounts on the actual machine. And we had people that were working in different places, uh, often at other universities, and they would have, it'd be like a professor and a bunch of his graduate students, and they would be doing something. And this whole notion then of having sort of outside groups working together and, and then having sort of a more centralized group vetting what's going on is uh, this structure that formed the basis for the BSD project and many other uh, open source projects today. Okay, so this actually brings us to the FreeBSD project structure. So roll forward now. Uh, we have a central source code repository. Where people get kind of confused as to what's the difference between Linux and FreeBSD. Linux is an operating system. Whereas FreeBSD is both an operating system and about 100 libraries and about 750 utilities. 750 utilities is not going to be everything that you might possibly want. It's really just sort of the core set of things that you need. And then all the other software is maintained in a thing we call the ports collection, which has about 25,000 packages. If you, if you had to look through 25,000 programs to try and find anything, you would never find what you're looking for. So they've been subdivided into categories. Uh, there's a big database on top of it so that you can just put in a query and say, you know, I need a browser, and it'll just give you a list of the browsers that are available, and then you can say, all right, I don't want you know, Firefox or Chrome or whatever it is you want. What is the community? How do we make it work? 
So the FreeBSD community can be described uh, as, in one word, it is volunteers. That's what open source is all about. There are very few people that are actually paid to do open source programming. That is actually somewhat less true today with FreeBSD because there are companies that hire people that their sole job is basically to liaison with the FreeBSD project to make sure that things get fixed, that stuff gets upstreamed, et cetera. Uh, but that's a relatively recent occurrence. The vast majority of the people working on the project are volunteers. And volunteers have a number of properties. The first property is they only do what they want to do. It's not like a company where you have a boss and he says, you are going to write this documentation. If you go to the volunteer and say, please write this documentation, they're like, I don't want to do that. I want to write this code, and that's what I'm going to do. And you know, so you don't, you, you, it's very difficult to, to you know, even know what's going to happen. You know, people are just going to work on what they're going to work on. And the second point is that it's the lowest priority. So if work intervenes, then they drop the, their volunteer work. If family issues come up, they drop their volunteer work. If they decide to go on vacation, they drop their volunteer work. So when they have time, they work on it. Uh, this, therefore, means you don't have a schedule, per se. I mean, there's somebody who is capable and excited and wants to do something and has said they're going to do it, but then something intervenes and they're just not able to do it. And so, whoop, all of a sudden, something you thought was going to be there isn't going to be there. And the last thing is that volunteers are transient. You don't typically get volunteers that just make a life work out of working on a particular project. They get excited about something, they come in, they do stuff, and then they go on to the next thing. I mean, that's part of the whole thing. You know, it's, it's, it's new and it's exciting and they do some stuff and then, you know, they got the, the widget in there that they wanted and now they go off and, and find, you know, the new shiny toy. So the, you, you have a lot of transients in the people that are doing stuff on your project. And as we'll talk about down here, you need to understand that that's happening and deal with it. Because if you don't deal with it, you just build up a huge amount of dead wood. And sooner or later, the, the, the ship will just sink from the weight. Uh, because there's just all these people you know, that are just spinning their wheels and not getting stuff done and promising to do stuff and not doing it, et cetera. And so you really need to keep the, 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 the people that aren't doing stuff, they need to leave. Because if they're just hanging around, they, they're just using up other people's times, which would be better spent actually getting work done. All right, so what are our goals here? Well, it has to be self-organizing, because we don't have paid staff or managers or any of the usual stuff that you would have in a company. And so we need to find a way of organizing things. If you're going to be successful, you want it to be democratic and contribution-based advancement, which is to say that uh, the biggest problem you tend to get with projects is you get an entrenched leadership and you can never become the leader and in, you know, often you can't even rise to be you know, one of the direct lieutenants of the leader. You can just get sort of so far up and then that's it. You, you hit the top. And a successful project, you need to have a flow all the way to the top. You've got to be able to change the leadership because otherwise the leadership becomes dead wood and that, that's even worse than having, you know, everybody else being dead wood. If the leadership is dead wood, then you, you're rudderless, and, and you, there's no good that's going to come of that. So you need to have a structure which allows people to rise to the top. And finally, you have to anticipate turnover and manage it gracefully. You've got to be able to get rid of the dead wood, but you can't just be arbitrarily saying, well, you know, you're, you're, you're not getting anything done. We're throwing you off the project, because then it just becomes this, you know, the inside crowd and the outside crowd. And again, you don't want that. You want it to be you know, fully inner, inner operating. And uh, you know, the reason that you get to stay is because you're contributing at some level. And it doesn't, you know, there's lots of different ways you can contribute. Uh, so you need a rule that says, this is the rule to, to stay involved with the project. And as long as you meet this, you're in. And as soon as you don't meet this, you're out. And it's a very clearly defined boundary, and everybody knows what it is. It, you, you can't argue that you know, the inside crowd is throwing the outside people out. OK, so this is all great, 
but how do you actually make this work? So the organization that we have with FreeBSD is you can think of sort of concentric rings. So the outermost ring are the users. There's millions of them. The users, although they can send and receive feedback for bugs and get involved in mailing lists, for the most part they don't. They just use it. And so it's great. I mean, that's the ultimate point of a project is to get your stuff out there and being used. But from the perspective of the operation of the project, uh, that they're relatively uh, unimportant. So the, the next ring in, which is the one that we do care a lot about, is the so-called developers. And these are people that are writing code, sending in bug reports, interacting with the, the project to get stuff done. They can submit changes, but they themselves can't change the, the core source code. Uh, they could change it in Git and send a pull request. That's one route. Of course, leads us to the committers. When you are a committer, it doesn't just mean you can change anything you want. You normally are authorized to commit changes to specific things. Uh, so if you're doing ports, you'll have a set of ports that you are in charge of, and you will, that's what you're expected to commit to. Uh, and then if there's the other things you want to commit to, then you need to talk to other people before you start doing that. For other ports, you need to talk to whoever's in charge of the other port. If you want to get down into documentation or code or other things that are in the core system, then you need to actually go through a process to get authorized for those. Okay, so that's all how we get people in. Now the other question is, how do you get people out? <laughs> the deadwood problem. And the rule that we have is automatic suspension of commit privileges after one year of non-use. So 12 months, you haven't done a single commit, at about nine months in, you'll get an email saying, you know, you haven't done any commits in nine months, and you know, if by the such and such a date, you need to do at least one commit, or you know, you're gonna, your commit's gonna be uh, suspended. Uh, and if you go for a year and it's not done, then on that day, uh, your commit bid is suspended and you can't commit anymore. Uh, for the next six months after that, you can get it back just by asking, saying, oh, well, you know, I, whatever, I, I'm back, I wanna do stuff again, and we'll give it to you. Uh, and then after 18 months, it's gone. Uh, and you have to go through this process again. Uh, and you'd say, well, you know, that seems kind of stupid. But the thing is that the project has changed over time. And after a couple years coming back, you know, we've switched source code systems or we've added fabricator or different bug systems or different IRC channels. You really sort of need somebody to get you back up to speed. Now, usually when you come in the second time, you get a mentor again, of course, and those are the ones that tend to zip through and be done in a couple months to, at a time, and then they're just like, all right, you're back, you're up to speed, go. So the second time in, or the third time in in some cases, uh, it's, it's usually a pretty quick process, but there's still, you have to go through it. Uh, and it's, it's just mostly to get up to speed with the way the project is working now. We're finally gonna get to the leadership. That is the core team, of which there are now nine members. We would draw from the committers, so anyone that wanted to run for core had to be a committer, and then all the committers would each get nine votes, and, and the, you know, they would vote for the nine people they wanted for core, and the top nine would become core. Once you're a committer, if you wanna run for core, you can do that. You don't have to be part of the inside group, you just raise your hand and say, I wanna run. You can politic in the mailing list as much as you want. I mean, everybody writes a little description of why they wanna be there. Uh, and many people just, that's the end of it, but other people run around and you know, try and get people to vote for them. The point is that, that anybody that wants to run can run. Uh, what, it, what is it that CORE does? Uh, they, they maintain the FreeBSD roadmap. The main thing they need to do is resolve differences between committers. So I just get two committers that just cannot, make, cannot come to an agreement on what should be done. And you need to sort it out. Um, their other job, of course, is admitting and removing committers. Licensing. We've got the traditional copyright. This is what large companies have traditionally used with their software. Uh, they generally lock it down. The software is either just flat out not available, or if it is available, it's only under a very tight non-disclosure. You're probably not even allowed to modify it. You certainly can't give it away. You can't change it and do your own thing with it. You know, that's what they sell. That's their IP. So there was a rebellion against that. And so the sort of open source software movement began. And on the one side, we had the uh, GNU project. Uh, and they came out with copy left. So the copyright is lock it down. Copy left is it's all out there, where you have to make the source code available, including any of your own work. 
So if you have a body like, let's say, the Linux kernel, which is under GPL2 still, uh, and you put anything in there, you have to give it away. The companies figured out how to get around that. What they would do is they would get patents, and then they would give away the software, but if you actually wanted to use the software, then you had to buy a patent license from them. And so they still could figure out how to monetize their intellectual property. So the, the uh, GNU people said, well, we can fix your wagon, and they came up with GPL3, where the source uh, has to be given away and free use of any patents that cover that source have to be provided. Linus chose not to do that with Linux, but most of the rest of the GNU software, which is what's usually packaged around Linux, has, has moved to GPL3, including the compilers and other things. GPL3 made a lot of companies kind of nervous, which has tended to help those of us with the Berkeley. We, we have Copy Center. We're not left, we're not right, we're Copy Center. Take it down to Copy Center, make as many copies as you want, do whatever you want, have a good life. If you want to give it back, great. If you don't, we don't care. The source and patent rights may or may not be provided. And you'd say, well, you know, what kind of open source project is that? I mean, they're getting everything and you're not. How can this be good for you? And the answer is that at the end of the day, we get pretty much as much back as they do. But it takes a little longer. There's sort of a learning curve that goes on. So company X comes along, takes FreeBSD, builds a proprietary product, doesn't give anything back, and then it comes time to upgrade to the next version. And when they go to upgrade to the next version, there's all this stuff, all these bugs they fix, and they have to bring those across, and all this other stuff across, and it's a huge headache to get it converted. And they go, you know, if we had like given this bug fix back, it would have just been there, and then we wouldn't have had to do this. And so you get this sort of little incremental set of stuff that comes back. And then they do the next upgrade to the next release, two years after that, and now they, uh, and they say, well, that was easier. Look, this stuff was fixed, but look, all this other stuff. You know, I mean, this isn't really our proprietary stuff. And besides, if we get, put it in there, then someone else will maintain it for us, and we won't have to keep bringing it forward to the new interfaces all the time. And so you get a whole lot more back, you know, and they just sort of keep their, their little bundle. And by about the, 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 the next cycle after that, they're starting to take this stuff that's, you know, basically specific to their product and trying to give it to you so you'll take care of it for them. It's like, no, I think that's your, that, that must be your IP. Really, you, you don't want to give that to us. You know? With, thank you for, for offering. Um, and so you know, what we find is you know, not only do we get stuff back, but it also means that companies have now started hiring committers so that you know, they have a direct channel to get the stuff put back in there. It has worked out well for us, and it, you know, the fact that it, you're not d endangering your intellectual property has brought a lot of use into to FreeBSD.